Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Heather Wild. She is joining us from Rocketeer here in Las Vegas. Uh, and she's going to be talking about uh, anticipatory design. So her session is called Practically Magic, How Anticipatory Design is the Future of Product Development. And I think this is something that if we're not working on it directly, we are um, likely to be already experiencing it in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so it's great to have awareness of it. But I do think more and more organizations are going to be looking at this in their product development. Heather is an award-winning six-time CTO and five-time certified executive coach. She was an early employee of Spirit Airlines, a founding member of Evernote, and she oversaw Evernote's growth from a few thousand to over a hundred million employees. So um, she's also worked with the US, uh, US Navy and NASA and many state and local governments. So I'm really excited to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Amanda. Hello, everyone. That was a great talk. Thank you very much uh, for a great opening. <laughs> um, and it was a good tee-in for what I'm going to be talking about right now. So uh, show of hands, who here has heard about anticipatory design? Wow. OK. Um, who here has heard about Buckminster Fuller? OK. So those of you who know uh, who Buckminster Fuller is, or a buckyball, maybe, um, that is uh, basically um, uh, he was the person who, a long, long time ago, uh, started people thinking about anticipatory design science. And that's kind of what we're going to be thinking about today. So every day, we make 35,000 decisions, conscious or unconscious. And this is, like, these are things that we don't necessarily think about, like, Oh, am I in the right talk? Am I, did I get the right type of coffee today? How am I gonna decide what kind of coffee to get from Starbucks? Like, is this person in front of me going to take forever or are they just gonna get a flat latte? You know, these are the kinds of things that we do and we don't even realize it. So a couple years ago, when uh, this is the hurricane that hit Dominica and completely flattened the country, I was looking at the TV and I immediately made the decision consciously that I was going to help. I wanted to give money, like some of us, a lot of us do when this kind of thing happens. So I went to the first place that I saw on the TV that said donate money. And I started to fill out the form. And then I continued to fill out the form. And then by the time I got here, I was just like, screw it. Because this is the form for filling out the information to just donate money. This is our fault, people. We are the ones that develop this stuff. So before I even got to submit, I was just like, screw it, I'm just gonna play some video games. <laughs> and thankfully, I found something that was easier that somebody just a few minutes later on the screen said, just text to donate. And I was able, from my phone, to text money and it connected my Apple Pay to just send money right away. Because somebody anticipated that I was going to have trouble with that form and give up. So on the one hand, there was a developer that was like, I want to help, but I need all this information. And on the other hand, there was somebody that anticipated from your phone, you already have all that information. And that's the difference between traditional development and anticipatory design. Those 35,000 decisions that we make every day make us so tired that this is a real thing in Google. You could type that right now, and people are asking Google how to Google. It is so hard that this is us at the end of every day. I mean, I don't even have to ask you to raise your hands. I know that you're doing that. So the, the products that we are creating to have us help sometimes cause us more difficulty. Live TV in front of a million sure. people? Sure. All right, Alexa, start spelling quest. Oh, Alexa, start spelling quest. Welcome to spelling quest. You will be asked to spell a word at each level. Keep moving ahead by spelling words correctly. 
Level one. Here we go. Can you spell the word climb? C L I M B. Sorry, that is incorrect. She said crime. Correct spelling oh, is crime? I C L I M B. <laughs> it was crime. Let's try okay. again. Do it again. Level one. Can you spell the word dinner? D I N N E R. Sorry, that is incorrect. <laughs> okay. Correct spelling is. Wait a second. Wait a second. E R. Now I know you said I that. I said that right. You must be here, man. Level one. You Can is. you spell the word dinner? D I N N E R. Sorry. <laughs> so, I mean, all of these technologies that we're creating to try and help us are really screwing us up. We're just so used to it that we have websites dedicated to how bad this technology is. I mean, we, have, we call them fails, and we laugh at them because we're expecting these things to screw up. Okay, show of hands and be honest. How many of you scream at your phones, okay, Google, okay, Google, okay, Google, <laughs> over and over and over again, or hey, Siri, hey, Siri, waiting instead of just typing in the phone. I mean, come on, you're wanting the technology to work and you say it's because you're training it, but really it's because you're so used to it failing that you're just accepting it to happen. So we know this, we're developers, we're technologists, we want this stuff to happen. So we create all sorts of things that don't necessarily need to work. Like, does anyone have any of these in their house? Do you know what this is? So it's a dash button. So the idea is kind of okay, I think. The, it's, you're supposed to have this for items that you don't necessarily think about, uh, but you always, like, when you need it, you need it right then. Um, so if you've run out of, say, detergent, then, or you're about to run out, then you hit that button and then it's supposed to show up like a day or two later. Well, if you need laundry right, detergent right then, then two days later is too late, I think. So the idea is good, but it's supposed to train over time and you're training the machine learning model to learn how you work. Now, Netflix is a great idea, right? It's supposed to give you all sorts of of recommendations and uh, all sorts of things to help you spend your time better and you can find information and, and things to watch. But really, it creates something called Netflix Roulette where you're, you're just spending time, about 45 minutes or so, just trying to find something. Because what you're doing is you're training Netflix's model for them to learn what kinds of things they should be paying money for to create so that you don't actually watch anything really good. You're watching stuff that they are creating. And this is all going into 2.5 quintillion bytes of data produced every day around the world. 2.5 quintillion. Wow. That's like, wow. So we don't, we don't have USB sticks that big. We're not going to anytime soon. And it's our fault. We're creating all this. So those 35,000 decisions that you're making every day, multiply that out by 7 billion people on the planet. That's so much data that we're not yet collecting. However, it's doing something pretty cool. It's allowing us to predict the future. And that is the basis of anticipatory design. So by using machine learning and mixing it with IoT, these devices like Alexa and those dash buttons, and even Netflix, and adding a little bit of really cool UX, then we can create some pretty neat UX experiences and anticipatory design. Now, before we had a problem of like without enough data, we had a low probability of being right. And when, a, when you have a low probability of being right, there's a high cost 
to being wrong. Because if, if you're suggesting something like early Netflix, the recommendation engine wasn't great. So people weren't willing to stay in and they had to give you high quality content. They had to be paying a lot of money to have all those, those really good A movies. Now, it doesn't matter because they're gonna, you're, they're gonna get you with something. So they can have, a, there's a low cost for them being wrong by suggesting that you watch Sharknado 8 because you're, most, you're gonna watch uh, Iron Sky 4 because like, hey, that sounds kind of cool to see the moon uh, be taken over by an alternate universe or something like that. You're gonna be like, hey, that's kind of neat. I can waste two hours on that. So in order for you to go from that old way of doing things with old recommender engines to an anticipatory design kind of thing, you need to collect data and a lot of it. That 2.5 quintillion, you gotta tap into that. And then create some relatively easy algorithms. It's like you're, you're using your old recommender engine kind of thing, but because you have so much data, you can make easier choices. And then you can just simply anticipate what people are gonna do. So some cool applications that people are using of this are, this is a book writing software. So, so this is actually uh, available on GitHub right now where you can tell it, like you just start typing a word and then it continues to write a sentence and it can do an entire book this way by anticip anticipating what you want of writing different genres of text. Um, these are uh, earbuds. Uh, this is the original version of them. I just recently tested out the newest ones that fill in the gaps of what people are saying to do automatic translation um, in 200 languages. Uh, I just used them on my honeymoon and it was kind of interesting because it was able to with noise canceling, figure out like basically what people were saying in real time translation. Oops, sorry, wrong way. Um, here is a good application of anticipatory design because uh, I'm sure you may be using this while you're in Vegas if you're traveling here. Uh, and if you're not, you totally should because we have some amazing restaurants here. Um, search for a restaurant it's going to uh, tell you how to book a reservation for it, uh, what tables are available, and if uh, it doesn't have an online booking integration with OpenTable, it will actually use Google Assistant to call and make a reservation for you so you don't actually have to get on the phone and call anybody anymore. Isn't that cool? So, and, and it will allow you to call an Uber directly um, or it also connects to a cab company if you have that app installed. And if you open up Uber, another anticipatory design thing they have is it asks you where to because it already assumes that you wanna book the Uber from where you're at. It's not asking you all those questions like, what's your name? Where do you live? Because it already has that from your phone. The Nest, anyone that has this, it's learning how you behave and you have the option to override that but it's learning what temperature and where your zip code is. So what are the people around you using? What size of house do you have? These kinds of things that it wants. And it has sensors that it can continually learn as well. Uh, so there are... Um, this is called magic. You just text it the kind of things that you need. And it does research for you. And then orders it. That is not a person behind it. it is a, it's just completely a computer doing research for you, orders it, it's connected to your phone or you could add additional credit cards, but it just gives you three options based on uh, machine learning and, uh, I mean, it's, it's doing natural language processing on the words that you're typing to do a search. 
this is Digit. Uh, there's a couple of, of products like it for finances, but it's hiding money for you, for those millennials out there that have no idea how to save. Um, it, it learns from your purchases, your purchasing behavior, that like you go to Starbucks on Monday and Friday. Uh, so on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, for example, it will take your Starbucks money as well and put that into savings. And, and then you're not necessarily gonna notice it because who actually looks at their bank account balance? Uh, does anyone, really? <laughs> yeah. um, so soon, you've actually saved, like within one month, you might have $250 in your bank account just from not going to Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, it, it does things like that. This is a product uh, that is, has been canceled at Google, but they're, they do a lot of things like this. They're anticipating gestures uh, and learning like what do people do that they would expect to be doing to learn for future products. Um, so like, do you expect to turn a knob or things like that? So expect to see something like this coming soon in a Google product. This is one of my own projects uh, where we use anticipatory design uh, in matching people together on, on travel. So like finding people that are like-minded uh, in personality to create trips and actually put them together on like real trips. We recently just had two people, uh, four people uh, in cabins on a cruise ship for 16 days each uh, through this algorithm <laughs> and it worked out really well. Um, so this is an example of anticipatory design uh, used on Medium. What's really cool about this one is that when you are logging in, instead of saying forgot password, it's saying email me a link to sign in. It's anticipating that half the time you log into someplace, you don't have your password. So instead of giving you a forgot password option and then you have to go through the whole forgot password thing, right on the login page, it's just telling you email me a link. So it's saving you three steps and being more secure by doing it. Okay, so Oscar went to this party with his friend and there was this toy. It was green, I think, or, or, or white. And he loved it. It had ears. No, wait, horns. Uh, it was a dragon. Unicorn or no, a dranicorn? I don't know. I took a picture. Did anyone know that Amazon had photo searching? <laughs> so when you're trying to find something and you don't know, you want to price search for it, or like you're at a kid's birthday party and your kid decides they have to have that thing but you have no idea what it is, uh, or you're trying to find that latest Paw Patrol thing, like take a picture of it, Amazon will find it. This is awesome. Uh, so in the, uh, there is an app now that you can take a picture of your face every day. Uh, here, here is the connection of it. And it will, over time, um, tell you if you have changes like in moles, uh, in, uh, in weight, in all sorts of things to notice. Uh, and it can predict whether you have a likelihood of gaining skin cancer or other types of things. So using uh, machine learning to, to do things without even, without your interaction. All you have to do is look in the mirror and do the normal things that you normally do. Um, a bike. A bike, if you like to, I mean, if, if you're a cyclist, without having to change anything about how you cycle, this will adjust the suspension settings for you if you want to ride on uh, cobblestones, if you're changing to a mountain bike or street bike or something like that, you just need one bike and it will adjust based on your riding. So these are just real world examples of the way that anticipatory design can work for you. And it also tracks for you so you don't have to have Strava 
you don't have to use all these other apps because it's tracking everything for you in one place. Now this doesn't exist yet, but it, it was in testing at CES last year uh, that it is a pod that uh, activates uh, for Uber for two people to come in and it knows uh, that one person's going one place, one person's going another place, and then it just tells you on the screen like it's this person's place to go off. So it's an automated uh, like Uber-like app uh, for people to go. T currently in testing in Dubai, uh, it's, it's, uh, they do it in one person per pod, and then the pod just stops when it's time for one person to get out. So this is just anticipating the needs of traffic flow. So all of these things, what they do have in common is people are primed to use them. They're, they're not new products. They're already in use. And we're willing to use something if we already are aware of it. We're not willing to try something necessarily if it's a new category. If it, like We're not as willing. But if it's something that we are familiar with, then we're more likely to do it. However, if, we, if the predictions are wrong, very wrong, then we, we will never use it again. So Target tried an exp Target is very far ahead of the curve with, with anticipatory design and machine learning. They are always willing to experiment. But recently, um, they correctly inferred based on purchasing data that one of its guests, uh, a teenage girl in Minnesota, was pregnant based on an arcane formula involving elevated rates of buying unscented lotion, mineral supplements, and cotton balls. Uh, they started sending her coupons for baby gear, much to the consternation of her father, uh, who, with his puny human inferential power, was still in the dark about his 15-year-old's pregnancy. So he sued Target. And they stopped this program. <laughs> um, so, but they were right. They, they, their machine learning model was correct. Unfortunately, because she was using her dad's Target card, it was, uh, um, it was, it was unfortunate. When you're using this properly, you can get people. Uh, you can let people know with like Target did, that they, they have the correct uh, information. You can send people notifications like Starbucks does uh, by letting you know, hey, we have a coupon available for you. Uh, like Target does, we have a coupon available for you. But if it's not great, um, then like you'll be sending somebody the wrong notifications too frequently. Now Amazon is like, it, is doing amazing things with this. Uh, one of the things that they have done very well is recently they've been getting um, one hour shipping uh, availability. And e like they've, they've gone down to one day and one hour shipping for their most popular products in a specific region. And they even filed a patent to, to get this down even further. What they wanna do is to be able to have an item on your doorstep basically at the same time that you have hit purchase. And so they, this is anticipatory shipping. Uh, how they're doing this is by testing to see what are the most popular products, uh, who, what are you looking for online, uh, what are your purchase intent, all sorts of things. And that's how they're shipping their, their local warehouses. And if you check the inventory of the Amazon Prime Now in your area, uh, that's like what is basically in the local distribution area. And you'll probably find that almost everything that you would want is in that already, like the, the daily things that you would want. However, it's still in the realm of creepy for people. So they cannot release that yet until people are more comfortable with the idea of if I hit the button within 15 minutes, that thing's at my door. So how can your company put this into practice? Like if you are 
are doing this, or if you're thinking about it, doing this, what do you need to do? First, your business has to be something that has a service. Like it has to have an IoT kind of component. Like you, you can't just be a single person that's doing that. Not that any of you really are, but you have to have some kind of service like Amazon that can deliver things uh, or, or Digit that is a financial service company that can be taking people's money digitally away. Then there has to be some kind of digital access. If there is a digital access, then it is like you can now collect data from people. The, the data, as I said before, is the most important part of any anticipatory design thing because without that access to that quintillion section of data, you cannot get it. Then you have to be automated because there's no way that you can get there without AI. Like, you, you gotta have the robots helping you out. Then, it, then you have to be automated. So that service that you started out with, you need to come up with a way to automate it and continue to keep it automated. And then here's the most difficult part of all of this. Because this is based on taking choices away from people, like, like in the very beginning, my example about the Dominica hurricane, originally I used a form that had all of those fields. But the one that I went through was text this number and, we're t and how much money and done. So I had to trust that by giving my money amount that it would be fine. So they had to, that second company had to determine what, that they could take away all of those fields and it would be okay. So you have to figure out for your company what ethically you can take away to make it still easy for your customers and functional for your company. Because like with Google and their gestures, like when they do that, when they create a product that is gesture based, there's going to be people out there that want some kind of way to access it with, with some kind of menu that isn't gesture based. But they're going to take that away. There isn't going to be one. Like with the Nest, there's, there's like a hidden menu for pros and stuff. But even with that, there's some things that aren't in there. So you have to learn what can you take away and still be like delivering the service that you want. Then you need to analyze the data that you're receiving. And you need to constantly be analyzing it. Like every day, multiple times a day, what is the data that you're getting back? And if, if there are outliers, I always pay attention to the outliers, not the, the clusters. Because if there are outliers, that means that, that something is going wrong somewhere. And when you, like with anticipatory design, you've taken away choices. So if you've got outliers, that means that there is something wrong. Because there shouldn't be something wrong. Because if people don't have choices, then they shouldn't be making choices that would cause outliers. Constantly be coming up with ways to streamline. Because if you have, like with Medium, with their forgot password, they went from a minimum of three steps on the forgot password process down to one on the login. So if that's, that's now five steps down to one. So if you can look for anything on your site, in your service, in your company, everywhere that is causing multiple points of friction, that is a place where you can improve. And remember that whatever you do have should add value. So while you're taking things away, remember that the things you keep 
need to be value adds. So again, with Dominica, with the donation, the one thing that they did keep was the most important of how do I get the money there fast? And it worked. And I did get a donation receipt that had all of my information. And, and then at the end of the year, I even got a donation confirmation receipt from my tax return. So it was all in their system for everything. Please pre-populate your forms, people. Like if you've got, if you send somebody an email, this is one of my pet peeves, that has their information in the email, and then you click through, and it doesn't have even their email address in the email address field on the form, oh, I'm, I'm probably gonna stop doing business with you. Like, it's, it's easy, like you should be able, I mean, there, there are secure ways to obfuscate when you go through for the token. It is so easy to do all this, but people are like, oh, no, I can, it, because it went through intercom, I can't do it that way. Yes, you can. There's ways to do it. Smart things. Life like never before. We can do all that now. Imagine what we'll be doing in just five years, ten years. I mean, was anyone at CES this year? The Jetsons are here, man. I mean, they've been promising that since my parents were kids. So we have the ability to create these experiences in such a beautiful way and take away all of the pain points, take away that decision fatigue that we have been dealing with for the past 15 years or so that we've, we've forced upon ourselves. So we can go back to this, like, we can go forward to thinking about new technology and a world where all of the, the pain points are taken care of for us. So, but the most important thing to think about is what are we able to take away without losing our integrity? So all of those things, if you're interested in learning how to create them, how to build them, how to integrate them, here's some resources that uh, you can use uh, to start building, start playing around. And it doesn't matter what level of technologist you are, even if you're a marketer, there's some of these things that are really easy to start with. Um, and I, I seriously encourage uh, even the, uh, 
even the, the least technical person in this room to go out and get a Raspberry Pi and start playing around because they're, they're so fun to, to start automating things and, and seeing what's possible. But uh, I want to thank you for having me here. And I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. I think I have a few minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes. So, great. I will make the slides available, yes. Okay, you talked about the constant analysis to improve it, the experience. Mm -hmm. There's too much data to analyze with human element. How is that analysis done accurately? So there are tools uh, available for, uh, there, there thankfully are machine learning tool, uh, tools available to do constant analysis. And what they can do is they can bring you um, like you, you can set them to alert you when there is that kind of outlier event that I was talking about. Um, but they can also give you reports that are even in natural language. Uh, like Quill is a great one that I use um, that tells you, uh, here is what happened on this day. Um, here's all of the information that you need to know. And it just outlines, I mean, it just tells you every day what you want to know. Hello. Yeah, I'm, I'm a grumpiest person in this room. Uh, uh, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned outliers, which are outlier, is there something wrong? Mm -hmm. But it's not always. Sometimes it's an early indication of the change. Yes. You know, and what's outliers now, it could be, uh, could be norm uh, later. This is an uh, anticipatory uh, example I gave you. Uh, I, I go to the local bar every every Friday, and the bartender now that see him that see me, he immediately goes to to prepare my drink, but I don't want to this particular drink. I don't want to give to the drink Guinness anymore, but uh, but I don't want to uh, disappoint him. So I had to drink this Guinness again. Yes. So um, so one of the things that. Uh, the Starbucks uh, model has done is they have a uh, an anticipatory model where in the mornings, uh, or so they they actually have a, a model and a test that they've used where they will prepare your drink for you before you get there um, in some stores, and then they'll send you a note saying like, hey, uh, we'll give you fifty percent off your drink. Uh, like, why don't you come come in and pick it up? And then it's already ready for you when you get there. Uh, but if it's not the drink that you want, then they'll just trash it and you can order another one. Um, and then they're, they're using that to train their model as well. Uh, so for example, like with that, uh, like I have a drink that I order in the morning and another one that I order in the afternoon when I'm there. So they've learned over time to offer me the one in the morning and the one in the afternoon, but they had to trash a whole bunch of ones uh, from mine. Uh, and I noticed that my name was on some drinks that they would just pull back. Uh, before I noticed that. Um, so, yeah, so yes, uh, that's one of the reasons that I always recommend that you pay attention to outliers because, uh, like, when you're doing this kind of model, the people that are paying attention, I mean, the people that are, are just following the thing as uh, the, the people that are just happy to not have to make a choice will be fine. But the people that are most useful data, are the ones that will fight you along the way um, in training your model. Uh, hi. Uh, good to hear that you were able to donate by your text message. And you had <laughs> Apple Card, uh, I mean, Apple Pay had your card. How do you see this in your experience unfolding from a product management perspective on a regulated industry, like a financial? And uh, I come from a DNA science company. Yeah, we don't have your DNA data integrated with your Apple Pay, right? So uh, a lot of the things like simple, doesn't really like work simple in a regulated industry. And how do you see this unfolding from that context? So again, you have to find what is the what are the choices that you can take away for your own industry. Um, in Target, they they used the data that they have, um, and 
uh, they've figured out ways that they can. Um, in, um, in logistics industries, they're figuring out what they can pre-order uh, for their own companies. So whatever data it is that you are able to collect, you can run predictive models on that, and then you can make it easier. Maybe it's just internal. Maybe it's not your external company. Uh, I mean, customers. So you just have to figure out what data you do have and who your customer is, and it could be your internal customer. So maybe it's making it so much easier for your HR people to onboard. Um, and uh, if, if you have the ability, uh, everyone has data that they're collecting, and everyone has pain points. So that's just figuring out what those pain points are. I got a question, and this is more um, about the anticipatory design. Uh, what's the risks that a company would have for setting up like different menus and different options and things like that to marginalizing people with accessibility options or uh, disabilities or the inability to use what we anticipate? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, one of the things that I've found with anticipatory design models is that it actually uh, lends more towards accessibility um, because when you don't have tiny buttons to press or more fields that you have to fill in um, and you're leaning more towards uh, speech recognition and like voice recognition tools and gesture based models or just one button that you have to press uh, you're able to actually add more accessibility tools in into it um, and making sure that, uh, so yeah, these, these actually flow really well with accessibility. Um, and if you look at almost all of the examples that I gave, like every single one of them passes pretty much any accessibility test you'll throw at it. So that's a great thing to keep in mind when you're designing as well. Hey, I got a question. Like there's this kind of stuff that's gonna reduce jobs right out there over time. So I'm just wondering, for those people you know, who are working those jobs, what would you, be your suggestion of what they're gonna do when the machines take over? That's a great question. I actually have a nonprofit designed specifically for that. Um, so, I, so the jobs that exist right now definitely are going to change in the future. And, um, but there's going to be a new class of, of employment, a new class of jobs that are going to be created around uh, around this um, because people want to deal with a human face. They, they need critical thinkers. We're always going to need creatives. We're always going to need a person somewhere to talk to. And so while uh, we're taking away like the low level knowledge worker skills, uh, we're adding back in jobs and, and places for people to be human. And I think that's uh, something that we haven't really addressed. And so people are going to, uh, we, there is definitely a generational shift that's going to happen. And it's probably gonna, it's gonna hurt for a little bit, but uh, I think it's gonna be a really cool world once that does happen. This will be our last question. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I have a question uh, related to anticipatory design. So it seems the key word there is anticipate. And uh, we're fallible, we can't anticipate everything. Um, and we have some biases that, that affect maybe the judgments that go into AD when we're uh, uh, you know, laying things out uh, initially. Uh, what, um, what do you think we're able to do to self-correct? Or are there things to either detect or self-correct once detected? I think that the main thing that we can do is add more people into the model and be as diverse as possible. Make sure that everyone is at the table. And once you add the swarm, once you add a, like more and more people to train that model, um, it will self-correct. So uh, the yeah. So for example, the the first anticipatory uh, hand uh, cleaners in. I mean, uh, faucets in washrooms were not diverse enough. They only looked for hands like mine, but now they have corrected, they're getting better because there just weren't enough people to train that algorithm. 
but we are getting better the more people we add to the model. So thank you very much. I've uh, enjoyed being here, and uh, I hope that the rest of the conference is great. Thank you, Heather.